Digital. My name is Glenn Swan. I'm the director of music production here at Premier Studios. And I do a dual role where I manage the studio and book the rooms and coordinate all the projects involved. And I'm also a producer on my own. Formerly an artist on Warner Brothers Records. And uh, I've been doing this over 25 years. And I've worked on many famous records. Uh, um, many. I started out doing all the Uptown MCA stuff like Mary J. Blige and Al B. Shore and Father MC and Joe to see which was my favorite. Yeah. And, uh, and that flourished into doing all the uh, flavor unit stuff with Queen Latifah and uh, Naughty by Nature and all those guys, uh, Nikki D, Apache, LaShawn, who I, who I loved much. Her name, she actually used the name Almond Joy. Incredible rapper, man. Wow. But never saw the light of never. day. Yeah. Never. She did have a smash hit record, though, on for LL Cool J. Oh, uh, yeah. She wrote a record that LL Cool J used, and it became a smash hit. LL Cool J, yeah. That's, that's and, big. Uh, and, you know, when you work in a studio like this, you have access to a lot of the top clients in the world, and you get to be in the rooms with them and watch what they're doing and learn from them, and it's been a wonderful ride. Currently, we just completed mixing J. Cole's new album, uh, Young Jeezy, uh, some Broadway show stuff, uh, an artist named Joey Badass that's working it's with no Johnny Shipes and Shaw Money. I have Shaw Money in here a, a lot, and the great engineer Pat Viola. Um, and it's just various artists, whether it be Epic Records, Atlantic Records, Trey Songs works in this room a lot. Uh, a lot of great people. Wow. I also do a lot of television and film stuff. Oh, you do television? Yeah, I yeah. just got done doing uh, Pixar stuff with uh, Steve Buscemi, the star of Boardwalk Empire. And I had uh, Tony Shalhoub in here the other night um, doing voiceovers for a Pixar movie. I've had DreamWorks pictures in here quite a bit wow. with Bill Hader. Yeah. Top studio stuff. Yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff when they come in here because it's all very high end video related yeah. as well as audio. So, you know, we we really you do know, it all. We professional do stuff. and film and uh, we do a lot of stuff for the news industry like CNN and Fox News Network. And, uh, and then, of course, we service all the big recording artists as well. Uh, just when it gets really busy coordinating everything and making sure that you're prepared. If you've got four studios going at the same time, some people might need X amount of microphones and the other people need X amount of microphones and you have to be aware of what everybody's taking to make sure that you don't run out of stuff. Yeah. And then you've got to coordinate with people who are working on all the sessions. You've got to coordinate with the rental companies for rental gear if there is any. You have to work with the assistant engineers and the engineers to make sure that they all have what they need to do what they want to do. And uh, yeah, it's just it can be it's a, well That'd be doing my job. It's a job you live. It's not a it's not a nine to five. Mm -hmm. The money isn't what it used to be. The business is different now. Yeah, everything labels changed. are real nitpicky about everything they pay for. When I was coming up, it was all major label sessions 24-7, and you could do whatever you want. They just paid the bill. Yeah. And today, people are very scrutinizing of every penny, and they're always trying to cut, cut, cut. And it makes it very hard for studios to exist now. Like a studio like Premiere, we have four rooms. we got two writer's rooms, and we have two big SSL rooms. And this studio has to make about $70,000 a month just to break even. So if you were the owner of this facility, you're basically making nothing until you go over 70000 a month. Wow. So if you can imagine that kind of overhead, that's a tremendous responsibility. And you got to try to do that and make money on top of it. Right. It's a lot. I was born in California, in Anaheim, and then I was raised in New Orleans. And uh, I was a jazz musician, playing guitar at a very young age. I studied with Wynton Marcellus' father all through high school. Uh, 
uh, I was the guitar player, Harry Connick Jr. was the piano player. Uh, my best friend Reginald Beal, who's one of the most revered bassists in jazz today, was the bass player. And my other best friend, Noel Kendrick, who was a drummer, incredible drummer, but he became a drug addict and it ruined his life, destroyed him. And, uh, and then I went to Berklee College of Music, and, uh, and I was in a big hurry to get to New York City. I was a very accomplished guitar player. But I didn't want to be the best jazz musician, guitar player in the world, you know. I didn't care about that. I wanted to be like Prince. I wanted to play all the instruments and sing and write songs and dance. And so I came to New York and I looked at all the records to see where all the top records were being made. I saw the names of the recording studios on the records. And then I started going to all those studios in the city trying to get a job. And eventually I got one at Unique Recording Studios. And I worked there for a long time. and. Um, as soon as I got in there, it was very, very exciting, and I worked very hard, and I worked for two years for free as an intern. Two years. But it was 24-7, the biggest stars in the world, and I'm telling you, it was very hard for me to even go home. I was yeah. sleeping, like, on the floor at times, <laughs> and on the couches. I definitely understand you, man. It was very exciting, and, um, and, and I knew that I was in the right place if I wanted to be an artist, and I was in there making my demos, and... You know, and then you befriending the agents and the managers of all these stars, and then you start giving them your demos. And I met Vincent Davis, who was the uh, who was Keith Sweat's record label of entertainment, and also his manager. And I uh, became friends with him, and I gave him my demos. And then uh, he liked what he heard, and then offered me a contract. And and it seemed like. Everything was going to be great, and then uh, my record never got commercially released, oh, no. and I was stuck in the deal, and uh, and it went nowhere. And I was very ignorant. I was very young. I got a lot of money when I signed the deal, and I blew it all in seven months. And I th thought that when you sign the, a deal with a major label, that's it. You're going to be a star. <laughs> and I just, you know, I so acted I, I like, guess a star like a star before I became mistake, a star. Right? Yes, and before I knew it, I was broke. I still remember to this day going to the bank machine on 231st and Broadway and it's saying insufficient funds mm. and I had a baby on the way and then the next thing you know the IRS is calling me because they want me to pay taxes on all that money I got paid and I was like oh I gotta pay taxes? I didn't know anything. Oh my god. I'm... Yeah and it was a very humbling time and, uh, and I tried very hard to get back as an artist but they wouldn't let me out of the deal. So they not only were preventing me from being successful by doing nothing with me, but they were preventing me to going with Uptown MCA, which I was getting close to going there, and uh, for whatever reason, they wouldn't let me go. Mm. And uh, after about four years, I finally went to all the top attorneys in New York City, and one of them said he'd help, and he got me out of the deal, but I had to sign an agreement. Anything I did in the first 18 months after being released, uh, they get paid a lot of money. And at that point, the business started to shift, and, um, and the opportunities weren't there. And then I started focusing on producing, and then I was working with Notorious B.I.G. and uh, his cousin Lance, Un Rivera. And Un, um, those guys were going to sign me, and it got very close. And next thing you know, Notorious B.I.G. was murdered, and that was the end of that. And then I just went back to working in the studio, and... I started doing the management part of it, and I just, over the years, climbed that ladder in the admin area. And then I left Unique Studios and became the manager at Chung King Studios, which is a very famous facility. And then from there, I went to Sony Music Studios and became the manager there. The most important thing about this business is it's about relationships and who you know. And I knew everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, after all the years I've been in it, you know, you get to know right. all the players and they get to know you. And and Tony Druden, my mentor, uh, was the director of Sony Music Studios. And he and uh, Rob Robles, who I also worked with, who became the manager of Sony Mastering, they all brought me into Sony and I got hired. And it was absolutely wonderful, and it didn't last long because uh, Tommy Matola, who owned the property, wanted to sell it, and he did. This is one of those businesses where you could go to school and spend a fortune getting an education, getting certification, a bachelor's degree, whatever the hell you get, and you could be the best there is and never make it. 
because yeah. this business doesn't really love you back. It, you gotta it does learn. on occasion. Some people really do make it, but I know from experience, lot. from watching, those people were so fucking driven. Excuse me. So it's okay. Driven. And it really is the difference. Those... Oprah Winfrey said it best. If you have a passion for something, you will find a way. And she was right. I guess my favorite part of it is just um, being around this. Being around the people, the equipment, the it's artists, like home, right? the music. It is, yeah, it is home. But, you know, economically it's changed so much that it's not rewarding anymore financially. I make great money at Sony. I don't do that. I don't make great money anymore. Right. You know? And so it's kind of like... Uh, more like for the love, like, you know. That's right, because it's kind of like I'm like... If you look back in the days of the auto plants in Detroit... You know, you could kind of see me like the supervisor of an auto plant, and I worked my way up from the bottom, and now I'm the big supervisor, and I got the big job, and I'm getting paid great, and the car manufacturing business is on the way out. <laughs> it's like, what do you do? You start yeah. a new career somewhere? You know, it's just, I'd rather make less money and still be doing this. Something you love. Something yeah, you really because like I love it, than you grew up with. make a lot of money doing something I don't love. Just take every day as it comes and make decisions based on what is in front of me. <laughs> I was going why? Which why? I guess that would be my philosophy. That would be your philosophy. <laughs> 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 Just make decisions That's when right. the day comes. Just like I mean, you do. You wake up and things come your way, and you, yeah, you and then make from the there best you... decisions for you based on your knowledge and experience and wisdom. You know. The best advice I can give any of anyone who's listening is that uh, you have to remove the fantasy element that you have in your head of being in this business and you have got to know with the utmost clarity that in this business dreams do not just come true you have to make them happen and it's very important for you to get in a circle where these people are working because this business is about relationships so you could be the most banging ass beat maker there is, and if you're not around the people in the studios here or whatever, you, you're never going to get your stuff to their ears. So you have to find a way, you have to have a passion for it, and you have to be willing to take a lot of crap in the process because, you know, this is art, and art isn't about commerce and making money. You know, those who are successful and make fortunes are very, very fortunate. But there's many people better than them who never get an opportunity. I see all the stars in here all the time. Yeah, yeah. I hear them singing. I watch them do their work. And I know people I can name by name that would blow them all away. Who are nobodies. They're, they're somebody from a reflection standpoint. Like people have seen them and know they're incredible. But they're nobody on the world stage of yeah. fame, celebrity, and money. Premier Studios originally was Quad Studios. I mean, most people constantly uh, associate Quad with the shooting of Tupac, but Quad is much deeper than that. It was here long before Tupac was, and long after, as you can see. And Quad is over 30 years old, and it originally had five or six floors in the building, and the owner was selling the studios when we had the real depressed recording economy when everybody stopped using big studios and uh, he sold it off in pieces so Premier took three of the floors completely refurbished them and fixed all the classic gear that was you know it was a 30 year old facility so a lot of stuff was broken down and not being repaired because the studio wasn't making money where they could pay for all that because maintenance is very expensive I mean one guy working on stuff can charge you $35 an hour to $50 an hour and if it takes him two days to fix something, think about that. That's significant money. That's four or five hundred dollars. Uh, on our website, premierstudiosny.com, and on there is my email and phone number.
Well, to the young people, if we're talking, if I'm talking to the people that want to work in the studios and do this stuff, just know it's a long haul and it's a grind, and you don't make any money whatsoever for the first year. You'll pretty much work for free, and then when you finally do get in and start assisting on stuff, you'll get ten bucks an hour, no benefits, no vacation pay, and so this is something that you do because you love it. And you better know your stuff because you'll be gone in two seconds if you don't. And you, if you have the opportunity to work in a place like this, you have to appreciate it. Because there's many people who will take your place in a heartbeat. And um, that's pretty much it. If you want to do this, just know that you're going to struggle. But if you have a real passion for it, you're going to find a way.